Peace Mutual, a tattoo artist from London. I just tattooed by hand, so I just have a tattoo needle attached to a stick. When I was young, tattooing felt like a small world. It was a radical act of self-expression that could scandalise your parents. I want a little tattoo high right now. Feels so good. Today, though, it's everywhere, from the mainstream to the underground. What Gracie could have looked like if she didn't f*** her face off. I'm travelling the globe to meet the artists, the rebels and the weirdos who made this niche hobby a global industry. This time, I'm heading to the Southern Hemisphere to discover one of the spiritual homes of tribal tattooing. from a hook in my chest, attached to a rope, tied to a tree on the other side of the planet. Everyone just wants to breathe in some of the sage and give thanks to, and also just ask us to keep us safe. So I'm going to do um, a vertical um, and I'll do the point down. Um, so take a deep breath in. Go. Well done. Thank you so much. Feel good? <laughs> yeah. Just gonna sit here for a couple minutes, just breathe some of the air, and then get ready for the pull. I'm with a group of young tattoo artists on New Zealand's North Island, hanging out in one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen. of global tattooing, tribal. Known as Tamoku, this is the main tribal body art that originates from the Polynesian islands of the South Pacific. And as a rite of passage, Tamoku is a sacred tradition in Maori culture that through the generations symbolizes a connection to your ancestors and your land. However, these traditions came under threat during colonization, where laws were introduced that explicitly banned Maori people from using their indigenous language and cultural practices. I'm tattooing everyone. I'm doing an old symbol that I came across, and it's basically um, your magic circle. So I've only ever tattooed this on um, dear friends. Have you got anything on your palms? Nah, okay. It does pack a bit of a punch, I'm not gonna lie. Does that feel fucking horrible? Mm hmm. Yeah, sorry. They say that getting your palms tattooed is like definitely up there. For me, I thought my ass, my palms, and my boobs were the worst. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I'm ready to claim my tamoko just yet. I, I want to go back to my iwi and like reconnect with my family who I don't really know down there. When we were colonized, they didn't just, you know, like hide the knowledge of our entire history. They killed the people who knew it. It's not like stored somewhere in a library, it's gone forever. And that's why things like Tamilgo are so precious, because they are your lineage. So they're very specific designs depending on what, what iwi you come from and tribe and your family. And to get it, you need to sort of deserve it. We also have a huge issue with pretty much blatant cultural appropriation. And it's totally okay for a white dude to get a completely meaningless tribal tattoo. Whereas if you see a Māori person with a, like, specifically designed for their iwi and earned tamoko, it's still seen as gang-related. Being, like, part Māori, I learned to deal with the guilt early on because I had to face it. My ancestors are both 
the oppressors and the oppressed. It's quite hard to reconnect when you're urban because you don't feel white enough and you don't feel Māori enough. there has been a resurgence in Tamoko, and I'm going to meet an artist called Moko Smith, whose ambition is to help resurrect the traditional practices of his ancestors. Tamoko is our practice of marking the skin, and it's named after the lizard, which is the Moko, mainly because the lizard used to shed its skin, and so do we, and the idea is that we're not complete until we're reborn. And, uh, and our skin's been shed and our new skin's kind of been obtained. Every Maori person, or as far as I know, pretty much every Polynesian, back in the day, well, as soon as they hit pu puberty, were tattooed. And it's definitely evolved within the resurgence of moko into something quite different as well. Yeah, now it's bordering on tattoo culture. But my point of reference for moko is what the old people wear in the paintings. And now it's become a thing of, you know, reconnecting with identity, reconnecting with the culture, the kind of cultural weight that we have behind it. I think that's the, the real transformative power of, of what we work with. That's, that's the real shit. Yeah, that's you hit the nail on the head. With tattooing, I think something that's dying out, which I think shouldn't, is people learning to solder their own needles and things like right, that. Right. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. you, with the hand tools, you don't use Needles at all. What New Zealand Māori have done up until recently is use albatross wing bone, but um, are mainly pig tusk because it's such a good material. From the average boar tusk, how many needles would you be able to make out of one? I can get pretty much two blades out of a tusk. If you just to get the flat plate, how long would that take you? Yep, an hour, an hour and a half. So this is the bone here? Mm -hmm. And you what, attach this to...? Yeah, just plastic for now instead of using turtle shell. So we're just saving the turtles a bit. <laughs> I mean, we How don't talk too much take... about tool making because that's... So sacred. Yeah, it is hidden knowledge. If you were going to compare this to like a, um, a tat, like a conventional Western tattoo needle, this is usually a shader. And you tap hmm. on top. That's my biggest at the moment. That's for lining. That's for filling big black panels. These tools, they, they feel like they're part of me and always have been. It's charged with the landscape and the surroundings, and that moment becomes, you know, something really memorable rather than the buzz and the neon lights and the, you know... Shitty rock uh, music. Shitty rock music. <laughs> When I finished the first part of my training in the Rarotonga, and I was just about to come back to New Zealand, we found out that there's a traditional canoe about to leave the islands to sail back down to New Zealand. My teachers took that as a sign and said, look, this is your chance to sail back the tools following the steps that your ancestors took. But now I feel it's time to take the tools to continue their journey and to go down to my homeland uh, where, where my tribe is from, and that's the Rotorua area. There's an island called Makoya in the middle of the lake. I want to take the tools back to that island, to the place where my ancestors practice the art form. Breathing life into that practice. And it's something that hasn't happened in, you know, we could say close to 100 years. Can you just go there and do it? I've had to go back to our tribal meetings and, and put the idea forward to my elders. And I've got a cousin who we're going to work on and we're going to make a piece for her which is more contemporary, just so we're not trying to walk directly in their footsteps. The dream is that our leaders can start to wear moko again, you know, our leaders who are in parliament. And hopefully that'll go towards people getting facial moko again and wearing that in society. That's a beautiful goal to have. Mm.
I know that people have been using different types of bone and tusk, um, different cultures and tattooing for generations and hundreds of years. So it's not surprising to me that we're here finding a, a boar tusk for him to tattoo. It's just super interesting because I've never been exposed to anything like this before, you know. Working with the tusks demands a lot of dedication from me as well because there's a lot to cut them, shape them, not mess it up, you know, and then keep cleaning them and, and sharpening them for different jobs, which has you know, become part of our culture now. It is what we do. What will be a good tusk for you? I'd love that one. That would be really choice. Good to see it go to some good use. Thank you both for this. This is, this is really primo. Check it out. I've seen some women wearing them around their necks, yeah. and they're huge. When I came in here, I was thinking, they must have had to have been like elephant-sized pigs to the yeah, tusk yeah, that yeah. big, but now I understand it. It's the root of the tooth that goes in. No, no, it's like nice a choice, man. <laughs> Love you guys, Copa Pop. Thank you so much. I do mean. Heading back to Auckland, I'm excited to meet Kara, Mokul's cousin. This is the beginning of a tattoo journey unlike any I've ever known. <laughs> Everyone, Hi. this is Grace. Hello, Hello. ladies. <laughs> I love this, it's like a cute. <laughs> yeah, welcome. Hi, I've never been welcomed so warmly by such a beautiful group of females. Like, <laughs> I feel very lucky right now. I feel like I'm blushing a bit. You gotta have soul, baby. You're holding soul right now. Oh, in it. I got a soul tattooed in my belly. Really exciting to be the person who was going to be the first one in so many generations to go back there and get tattooed. How did you come to meet him and form this tattoo relationship? I know Moko, like we're from the same tribe. And after meeting him the first, like the first time and talking about what I wanted to get done, I was like, yeah, that's it. It's so spiritual. Is it something that the youth are aware of? Some of us are disconnected. Some of us are learning to be more in tune through the process of getting Tamako. People are rediscovering that history and reclaiming it, which is part of the process of decolonization when we have access to that stuff again. Getting Tamako isn't as simple as just walking into a tattoo shop. It's a significant ritual, often involving family and friends. Just being there for her, yeah. that's what I think most important about this whole thing. We're yeah. like family, so even though we're not blood related, and like as Māori women, it's so important that we're, we're together in these times. I thought my weakness was that I was half Māori or half Jamaican, in and out of different kinds of worlds. I never really felt that I belonged. And that's how I carried myself. And then I realised that those weren't my weaknesses and that I wasn't half of anything, that I was completely Māori, completely Jamaican, completely myself, you know, completely queer, all these kind of different intersecting identities that I can completely own now. Um, and I think that that's my strength. Kara is part of a new movement reclaiming her identity by embracing Tamoko. But for many years, the tradition has had negative connotations with associations of gang culture and criminality. I'm about to meet some members of one of the country's most notorious gangs to better understand their relationship with Tamoko and tattooing. New Zealand has a large number of gangs with Maori descendants making up the majority of members. Many members have used their facial markings as a symbol of rebellion against the colonial powers. So I am in Whakatane and I've come to meet up with a group of Maori boys. Nice to meet they you. are part of a gang called Black Power. They've agreed to meet up with me and have a chat, so we're gonna go meet them. Nice to meet you yeah. guys. Thank you for seeing me today. Yeah. How are you guys doing? We're good, good. Oh, yeah, we're doing good. Nice and hot today. Yeah, well, you got a few tanks on there. Yeah, I've got a few. Wow, you're covered. 
And all three of you are members of Black Power? Just me and Brother Zuds. Oh, I got shot on the heat. Whoa, bruv. Mm. Went in here? In here? In here? In a big hole. Also. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Picked up a key and After they shot you? No, before. Before? before. Shot to the head, still yeah. standing. Yeah. Was there at any point you thought, I have to rethink my lifestyle? <laughs> or was it just made you, did it reaffirm your, your strength within your family, your Black Power family? Oh, no, it actually reinforced more life for unity with the brothers. Brothers of the Fist, and proud of it. Could you guys identify your tattoos as being Tamil? Yeah. Could you tell me about Because your face yeah. is beautiful, man. It is my identity, who I am. I'm a Māori. I'm also a gang member. It's just all my people, my tribe, part of this land. The land is us. We are Tamil. That's what they really are, eh? Is the stories of your life. The Walking Diary, right? Yeah, Walking Diary. There was one saying goes, uh, what society rejects and throws away, Black Power picked them up and called them family. Tamoko is a powerful symbol in New Zealand, and one man has been hugely influential in reclaiming its original meaning. Tame has helped forge the path for younger generations to celebrate their Maori identity. This is his son's barber shop, so he's going to go inside and meet him. Nice to meet you. Are we going to get a haircut? Want to want to touch up? Oh, well, maybe, sure. maybe. Really, what prompted me to, to have a muka was a response to the gang stuff. Yeah, so we really need to go back and bring back the old markings. I said, our eldest, what do you think that we have a muko? And one of them said, oh, leave it alone. And I thought, hmm. So if you say leave the muko alone, so you're saying that we should not sing the old traditional song. No, 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 no. Well, it's the same thing. We couldn't really find any answers uh, as you do the muko. The best people we can talk to, the old ancient carvers. They know the story, the shape, the design, but we've not been radical. It's about taking ownership of something that's from ancient times. How was it for you after you got your face tattooed? I had to live by people staring at you. It took a period of about 10 years for people really to get used to it. What was it like for you, Toy, like growing up? I can imagine the kids that you went to school with, their parents didn't have full time local face tattoos. When you're at school and you're taught to follow the rules, then there's my father doing what he's doing, and there's a bit of a contradiction there. So at an early age, you find out that not everything and wider society is how it's, you know, really, really is. So the fight that these guys fought so that my children could uh, have their own language and have the opportunity to evolve our language is um, something we're thankful for. has actually asked me to tattoo him, which is a huge honour and a massive deal for me. I'm going to go down to his gallery and have a look at what room he's got left and have a little tattoo session. Thank you. Come to the gallery. Oh, cool. Great. I love the way that you've used trampolines as canvases yeah, yeah. as well. That's awesome. So we're still all creating this space. I just drew something out. 
What I've done is two triangles to represent his culture, his tribe, and one to represent mine. And then I've done two lines off the edge of each side to um, signify the knowledge and stuff that we pass down through each generation. Tattooing doesn't get any better than this, you know? Okay, you're all done. I never did be touched by a white woman on my skin. Tattoo, so I'm a late starter working on my skin. Uh, in my mid 40s. But I'm still doing it in my mid 60s. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, maybe some more next time we meet. Yeah, for sure. Somewhere. I would love to. <laughs> Iti's activism has inspired others to channel their energies into healing those in need. Here at the MMA Centre in Fakatane, gang members are offered an opportunity to turn their life around. Why have you got gloves on? You're not going to hit me, yeah? No, these, these are shoes. <laughs> Street ball, yeah? It's too bad. As an instructor or coach, I have to kind of adjust to their lifestyles, especially in Fakatani, because it's very kind of gang orientated. And... We've seen a lot of boys turn away from gang culture to kind of spend more time in the gym. Well, a couple of brothers come from the gang life, coming in here, you know, getting ready for you know a gang fight or something like that, and they actually fall in love with the art in the gym. One of our bros, he's left the gang and uh, he started to find his balance within this gym. How old did you start getting tattooed? Um, I was like 18. Started, I uh, got a few in jail. Some of the lifestyle I was living, you know. Just easy woman, drugs. Yeah, had my children and stuff, and I just didn't want my children to go down that lifestyle, I guess. So training has been pretty good because it gave me something positive to focus my energy on. I see you have some tamako on your, on your arm. Those three things there are for my, for my three children. It's brought me a lot of healing and stuff, a lot of the depression and shit. Kingy has invited us to witness a different event that he believes is crucial to the self-improvement of these men. You know, I was a gangster for for 26 years and that's more or less what I, the culture I was brought up in and, and that's, that's why I got the fists over here. It was just a, a meaning a statement to everyone. We were fierce and all that kind of stuff. Been out of the gang for like two and a half years now. After 26 years with the, with the gang, uh, I'm so grateful that I, I still stand here today. Man Up is an all-male support group which is run by the controversial Destiny Church, known for its strict conservative Christian values. But time um, you know, if the dad said, oh, son, you know you've done a really good job, as a boy, you'll be like, oh, you know, and you'll feel like a, you know, a proud little stallion, you know. You know, our fathers never said that um, enough to us. You know, it was usually, oh, you're a useless, blah, 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 or, you know, I noticed with my wife lately that, um, you know, just rubbing their back and holding hands, being affectionate. You know, I never used to be like that. You had to be soft sort of thing. But I noticed she likes that a lot. Brother, can you give it a little bit of a, a detailed elaboration of what, what it is to give a meaningful gift? See, would you give your, you know, your fiancé a pair of gumboots as a gift? What I have used in the past is maybe a small piece of jewellery. It uh, doesn't have to be uh, expensive jewellery, just something to uh, add to that sparkle. Seeing a group of men discuss their relationships with their fathers and weighing up the benefits of giving their wife a bit of jewellery as opposed to a pair of wellies is an enlightening experience. But more than anything, it was heartening to see how effective community is as a tool to heal, a belief that lives at the heart of Maori Tamoko. is travelling back to Rotorua to visit his tribe's meeting house, known as the Marae. It's here where he will connect with his ancestral community and begin the process of Kara's Tamoko. 
this place here, my mum always says, is where the old fairies used to live. It's a big thing for a lot of Māori, like the tribal area that they come from. It's so loaded what I'm going into. The people who are waiting for us at the marae are relations, so I'm safe in that respect. But they are like the top-notch kapahaka group. Who am I to even go stand in front of them? So I'm a wee bit scared to go speaking and, and like orating in front of them. This welcoming ceremony was not just a homecoming call for Moko and his mother, but a welcome for our whole crew, family and ancestors. Tēnei <laughs> anything like that to be in a place like this you really realize what family is. <laughs> There's a bit of a resurgence going on, which is an awesome thing. It's who I am. It's part of my identity, my culture, my tradition, and my tamoko represents my whakapapa, which is my genealogy. For me personally, it, it keeps me connected to my culture, and it also allows me to display my culture in a proud way to others. As you would have noticed, your friend, your heavily tattooed friend and modified friend, when she turned up, didn't scare our kids, you know? Nobody really stared at her as if she was any different because we come from thousands of years of body modification. You know, it's within us. Our kids know that when they reach a certain age or have performed a certain duty, they're allowed to be wearing moko as well. And they love that because that's all they want to be. They want to wear the moko, the moko of their chupuna, the moko, like what mum's got, what dad's got, what uncle's got. Because it's about being part of the tribe. Not only just the tribe living here now. Those ones up there, those ones in the hole. That's what connects us. They say, your moko, that's your friend for life. Take it to the hole. It lasts longer than you. We 
It was a beautiful moment of support for my cousins. Prepare the tools, prepare the design, tune them with Kara, and we can start the journey. Encouraged by the support of his community, Mokul sets about preparing the tools he'll be using to mark Kara's skin. The pace that I work at here sets the pace that I work at on the mat. This is just a really nice way to tune in, set the intentions. Could you explain to me some of the things on your body and what they mean? Yeah, we've got different patterns from all over the Pacific. Taratara and Pakatsi, which are Māori patterns. We've got Samoan patterns, weaving and tapa patterns, tukutuku patterns, which are also ours. Elements about strength and protection and protection numbers. You know, that we're stronger with our community or our family or our friends behind us. With your relationship and Kara and coming up with the tattoo design, how did that come about? Basically, we started creating a piece based on tiny core, which are like the weaving patterns of our culture. Because in our mythology, both came to the world at the same time. One was carried by the male, one was carried by the female. It's building on elements of the moon, which is that strong feminine energy. How do you feel about non-Māori people wearing Māori tattoos, taumoko? I'm not going to set down a criteria for it, you know, but I feel that there should be a connection with the culture, whether it is they've been here, they've travelled here to get it, they've met Māori, they've engaged with the culture, and then they're able to go through a process of figuring out what's appropriate for them. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's extremely insensitive to take something from someone's culture and have no idea of where it comes from or what it means, mm. especially if it's just down to an aesthetic as well. Mm -hmm. Some people are like, hey, you're only a 16th, you're not even married. Or, and other people are like, I'm a 32nd and I'm f***ing Māori, don't you call me not Māori, you know? And, and then some people like me are like, don't even use numbers. Identity is always evolving day by day and, and moment by moment, but the culture is always in you. Unlike most tattoo artists, Moko has very few markings. I wanted to know if he has any big plans for his own personal tattoo journey. This week we're really laying the foundations for the rest of my body. So moving from a very blank canvas papatea to um, probably some heavy work in the future, looking to nature for reference. Next step, facial work, making it acceptable and then making it celebrated. It's just growing so fast. But where I want to help take it is back to our traditional body placements rather than these kind of more Japanese style layouts. The real powerful centers of the body, like the face, the ass, the thighs, middle of the forehead, like, it doesn't get any stronger than that. No. Soaking in the hot pools, I thought ahead to tomorrow, where Moko and Kara together will further define their Maori identity. And I can't wait to see what happens. So I'm on my way to Makatu to meet up with Kara and her mum. This is where her mum lives. I spoke to her earlier and she seemed a little bit concerned. Sometimes we plan things and they don't go the way that we want to or, or our energies and our feelings towards that change when that kind of, that time is dawning. So the main goal is just to go over and have a chat, have a cup of tea with her and her mum and, uh, and just talk it all out, make sure she's all right. Hi, Cara. Hi, Grace. How are you? How are you? Good, thanks, babe. Welcome. Thank you. This is my mum. Oh, nice Tina. Nice to meet Grace, you. Grace, pleased to meet you. Pleased to meet you. I'm feeling a bit nervous trying to figure out whether the feelings that I'm having and the weather are signs that maybe we shouldn't be going to Makoya, that we should maybe take another avenue. I don't think it's a good sign, heavy rains. Perhaps our ancestors have, you know, put the storm so that we can't cross the lake. Because what I know of Makoya, it's a very historic place. 
one of the most significant things that I know of, it, it was a, a, a battle site. You know, our, our people were nearly exterminated there, so I don't know if I want my daughter to go in and spill blood. So all the elements are kind of telling you that this is not... It's just whether we should be crossing that lake and going to that island. Well, we can have a cup of tea and just listen to the rain. And listen to our gut. Exactly. I really love to be over there and to lay the mats out there and to do the work and to keep in mind all those practices that the ancestors had when they were over there as well. Kind of beyond me and, and my wants, really. <laughs> Maybe Makoya's not the go. <laughs> so what's the plan then? Maybe to go to our marae, to Nohoku, and have it there at home. Sounds like a really nice idea. Okay. Kara and Moku make the decision to head to Kara's marae to complete their journey. or whatever will happen out here, doesn't happen in there. So when we walk into this place, we're walking into Tunuhupu's body, but we're also walking into ourselves. So all of our history, our ancestors, our connections to the gods, the spiritual place, it's said to be the place of a woman. Our culture was just about totally obliterated just about our language, you know, through the outlawing of things, our spirituality, all of those things, the things we do, like muku, because they were steeped in ritual and prayer. So what you see now is a revitalization. I mo muku kowai, because that's my identity I'm claiming, because it's my birthright, this is who I am. You know, that's my political resistance. Shorts in London, you can't you can't even bring a friend, you know, and if you do, they gotta sit at the front. It's a business, whatever. So this is really nice. Like a family gathering. Richard, that is. Okay. I'll be looking at We're you. Not throwing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Setting up. I'm gonna help him in a minute where I can. Basically, because of the way that he tattoos, he holds the tool and then taps on top of that tool with another tool. So he doesn't have the free hand that you usually would use to stretch the skin with tattooing. So he has assistants help him and he's very kindly offered me a position as one of his stretches today. So I will be helping out with that in Kara's tattoo, which will be amazing. Kara wanted to tattoo on this side of the room because her ancestors, the pictures of them are hung up on the side of Marai, so it's really cool that they'll be watching down over her. We're just marking out the lines right now. And then you're going to do solid black and leave negative, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we came up with this idea of oh, yeah. having a, a guiding star and the moon element to, to reference that divine feminine. And then we're just framing it with what could be seen as different layers of the sky. 
To be there with her and experience this with her, like, and having her mum there and Aroha there, just like, just feeling that energy and expressing it through song, like mm. that, that's really, just, that just brings it out and it brings me closer to what I feel is my like whole. A lot of the time when I tattoo in London, I find it really hard when their friends are all around them touching them because it scrambles the energy that I'm trying to create, which is this yeah. calm space where I can try and take some of that pain away and we can have like a, a, like a beautiful experience. Yeah. But here, everyone is under this mutual understanding and they respect the energy and they respect what's going on and that. It's really nice. Just I've never had so many people surround me tattooing, and I felt so comfortable. At peak, yeah. like I'm feeling very privileged right now to be able to be here. Yeah, same. Like from a point of view as a tattoo artist, for me to be able to be so close, watching Muku tattoo, seeing what he's doing, and actually being part of the process, that's super special. But then, you know, to hear that mother song makes everyone feel like they're, they're a child again, you know, when, when they were young and their mum used to sing them to sleep. That's pretty much us, really. Ko wātea, ko wātea, aira ko wātea, haumie, huie, taekie. I thought it would have been um, a lot more aggressive to the skin, but it's not. Like, you can see even here, like, it's been just been done and the skin's like almost sealed it's itself sealed. completely yeah. already. And usually with a machine, you know, you, you chew up the skin in comparison to what you do with anything by hand. I was a roller coaster of emotions, I think. It was, yeah, I was overwhelmed being here, happy, felt privileged, honored to be here with these people around me. It was painful. Moko did an amazing job, but always knew he would. Watching Kara surrounded by her friends for this moment takes me right back home. For me, there's nothing more special than being in a group of beautiful women celebrating each other. And for the first time on this trip, I started to miss home. For Moko, Mokoya Island will have to wait.